Hi, welcome to this trading video for the Panalytical Ares. This is our latest XRD instrument and we're using it to qualify samples relatively quickly with only a small number of experiments that are selectable in the software. It collects data really fast and really accurately. I'm sure you're going to be pleased with the results. There is six positions in the sample changer. One, two, three, four, five, six. The main risk with this instrument is this auto changer picks up the samples. So when it's in motion, you shouldn't be putting your hands in here and you should never lift the door open at all. All your access will be through putting samples on here and through the touch screen. Now we're just going to quickly move on to how to fill a powder sample. You'll need a few things here. We've got the mount, the sample ring, the sample back, a glass slide and our powder. Now, if I put the camera here, so you can see what I'm doing. So the first step is to clean everything with isopropanol. And there's my isopropanol on my little cloth. Let's just make sure there's no residues from anybody else's stuff. That's great. Let's give our ring a wipe as well. This is probably the most important part. This is going to be in front of the diffraction. It's going to be in front of the... Oh, what's it called? It's going to be in, it's going to be in the way of the x-rays. That's what I'm trying to say. Give in this a clean as well. Looking as well to see if there's any powder residues from anybody else's stuff. There's nothing. Open all and clean my glass slide. And now everything is wiped off. Super. So with this, there's a little button here you can see. I push it, it makes this bit move. Wiggle, 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 yeah. So when you do that, you can push it to open it and put your sample ring in there. It's got to be in this orientation with the outer section here. I'm going to put a powder in that hole. So this is what they call backfilling a sample. So hopefully I don't get any preferred orientation on the surface from squashing things down. So I'm going to try and fill this up. Now this powder looks all right. Ideally, you want a powder that's below one micron. If anything above 100 microns, you start to get lower diffraction uh, patterns, lower intensities. I'm going to make a little bit more in there. A little bit in. So you can kind of push it to the edges. We're not putting any force in anything. There we go. And it's going to be great. And what I'm going to do with this is try and just flatten it out. And it's got to be completely filled. So I'm going to need a little bit of extra powder in there to make it sure it's dense enough. Especially here around the edges. Great, now I've got that on. I'm going to put the back plate on and that's going to clip over the top like this. Push down and it clicks. When it clicks, that means it's secure. Now I can put the whole thing upside down and the big reveal. Press that button in at the side, this one. Press it in and lift it up. And we've got a perfectly flat surface of a sample. Now I'm ready to go in our instrument. So after you've prepared your sample, it's time to load it onto the machine. I have my standard sample here, and it's just as simple as placing it into position. So you drop it onto the circle, make sure it's nicely centered. So it's not leaning on the edge like that. The machine won't pick it up. It has to be spot on. Once you've done that, you can select which experiment you want to do. So you can see on the software that there are one, two, three, four, five, six circles, and they correspond to the six sample positions that you can see. So I'm on the first position, so I'll select the first position. This is the last experiment that was done, and you can see down here it says next measurement. So I press on that. Now this window has only a few options in it. The measurement program, the sample ID, the file name, and any comments that you might want to make. So let's talk quickly about the Measurement program. If I push this down here, you can see there are eight different scans that you can do. 
and they vary only slightly. So we have a 10 minute scan with reduced fluorescence, a 10 minute scan that's rotating with reduced fluorescence, a 10 minute scan that's rotating, and a standard 10 minute scan. Then we have similar options, but for glassy or nano materials. So these samples are exactly the same as these, except they have a larger step size. So the step size in these ones is 0.02, and the step size in these glass nano ones is 0.04. And that is the only difference between them. So today, I've got a standard sample, so I'm going to select 10 minutes rotating. I touch this touch screen here for sample ID. I can type in on the on-screen keyboard, or I can go over here and type it in manually. So I'm going to type in here, SI, Standard. So immediately you can see that sample ID and the file name is exactly the same. I've got a bit of an error in there, so I can go in there, correct it. Yep, there we go, I can type and we're ready to go. So as soon as I press add to queue, what's going to happen is it's going to add this to the queue and as it's the only sample in there and there's not a sample running, it will immediately start to take it. So if I press this, you can see the shutter has opened, the wheel has come out, and it's picking up my sample now, taking it over to the circle, dropping it in, and putting it inside the diffractometer. And that's it. My experiment is now being performed. Now we can't change any of the uh, aspects of how fast the data is collected on this, what range is collected. It's always between 10 and 100, and it always takes 10 minutes to perform. This might limit some of you, but it's a great way for us to get really high throughput on this instrument. And that's what we're using it for. If you want to do particular experiments that go over only a certain range or collect over a certain range for a longer time, then you'll have to use the D2 or the expert. So if you had another sample that you wanted to run whilst the machine is running, you can simply add that. So I've got another sample here. I put it into position just as before. And I'm going to go to the touch screen, touch it. You can see that the data is being collected now on sample one. See this lock here, that's the sample that's in. Now I'm going to press sample two. You can see the old data. So I'll go to the next measurement and I can add that in. I can just add a, a 10 minute rotating scan. Somebody's got some data here in the file name. So I'm going to delete that, add my file name. Aluminium. Aluminium standard. And I press add to queue. So you can see now this has turned into a little timer symbol. That means that the next one that's going to be run will be this sample here. So once my data finishes collecting here, it'll start to run the aluminium standard. And you can see the file names just there at the top. So while we're waiting, I'll just quickly talk you through the menu system. So if we press this burger icon up here, you can see we've got some options. Measurement, data management, incident log, and to advanced mode. So you won't be able to go into advanced mode, but if we talk about the first one, that's how you get to this screen, where you can view the data that's already been collected, or which data is it being collected, or which data is waiting. If we go to data management, this is where we transfer our data to our memory stick. So right now, the only way to do this is via a memory stick. You can see on the side of the instrument, there is a USB port and I've got a memory stick right here that I'm going to use. So I simply put that in right first time because I can see what I'm doing. And you can see immediately my pen drivers come up in this export folder here, D pen pen. And this is all this uh, experiments that have been collected between these two dates. So we can change this if I did it a while ago. And today is the 26th, so I can go to the 26th and it'll show me all the data that's been collected. You see, we can't select the silicon data that we've just set experimented because it hasn't finished yet. But if I wanted to copy a certain result, I select them. These are the ones that I want. You press down here on copy results. You can also select here if you want to remove the files after copying them. Select copy results. And it says there, 
three items have been exported. The USB drive can now be removed safely. So now I can take my files. And on here, when I load it up, there will be a folder that says XRD. And when we open that up, we'll be able to collect our data. They are in XRDML format, which is the standard for all panelytical instruments. So as with all the other X-ray instruments, it's really important that while the shutter is open and the instrument is collecting data, that you check the radiation levels being leaked by the instrument. Now this instrument is very safe, much like all the other instruments in the building, but you still have to report it as part of the legal requirement of you being trained in here. So we do that with the radiation monitor, the gag counter. So the first thing we need to do is we twist this to bat and you can see the needle's gone into the green. That means that we have battery, which is great news. The next thing we do, switch it to on. That means it's going to collect any radioactive uh, signals coming through this Geiger Muller tube. The next thing we need to do is open the back of this and you will see we have a beta source here. And you, can you hear the clicking? And you can see the counts have shot up. Let me turn this around. The counts per second is quite high there, almost like 10. Yep, so we know the instrument's working. So we can close the back of this instrument again, making sure we don't lose our batteries. Very poorly designed instrument, this. Not easy to do one-handed either. And then we're going to use this one to kind of scan around the area, listening for counts. So I'm going to follow the creases around where the x-rays are kind of pointing. I'm getting less than one count per second here with this monitor. I'm going to move it around, looking at the seams again here and the other side. We'll go to the back, you can see this panel is missing, but we're going to leave this off all the time so we can see the water. Around this shutter area. And you can see that there is no x-rays escaping from the body of this. So I'm happy, I didn't hear lots of clicks, which is great news. I can put this back in here and it's very important that we turn it back to the off position again. Now, we're happy that we're not exceeding any radiation limits inside the lab. We need to go and scan this with our phone and we will be able to fill in the logbook. Hi, Rob from the future here. Now, to record the radiation level, there's lots of these posters with this QR code around the lab. All you have to do is visit this site here or scan this code in and you'll be directed to a form. Here is the form. So first it requires you to fill in your full name, then your position in the department, then it'll ask you what instrument you're using, so you're using the Brooker D2. After that we have information on the date and time of your experiment, your supervisor's initials, if you have a supervisor, and finally the count per second. So this comes directly off the rate meter, so you'll notice that it'll hardly click at all generally. So you should be down at this end where it's between 1 and 5 counts per second. If it's much higher than that, it's probably because the instrument's a bit broken. Usually these cables get a bit damaged at the ends here, and that can cause it to count more often. So the best thing to do is go and find another monitor and try that one. If you experience the same with high count per second, above 10, what you need to do is turn off the instrument with the big red buttons and come and get us straight away, okay? And the last thing to fill in on the form is your COSH number or your risk assessment number. So everything that you create in the department is probably covered by either a COSH or a risk assessment. That needs to be brought into the lab with you every time you do your experiment and it should leave with you when you finish your experiment and you should note its number down here. So if at any time during your experiment you realise I've put the wrong sample in or you need to stop it from whatever happening, it's quite simple. Just press the abort button here. And that aborts the data, stops collecting, opens the shutter and removes your sample. That goes away and the door shuts and back into the middle and you can take your samples away. And you can see on the screen there's this red exclamation arrow because it didn't finish collecting the sample because you aborted it. 
that's fine. So when your experiment's finished and you've removed your data with your pen stick, it's time to remove your samples. Please do not leave your samples in the lab. It's not my responsibility to be tidying up after you. It's your responsibility. So you take them away, dispose of the material inside in any way you want. So you can keep it, you can throw it away, whatever you like. Just make sure you obey the stipulations in your crash form. This sample is inert. I know that for a fact that I've completed my cosh form, so I can just put it straight in the bin, okay? It's really important that after you put it in the bin, you clean it out. So what I'm gonna do is I'll show you how to do that. So it just pops off. Sample should just fall out. Give it a good tap, and it should hopefully come out of all the rings. And now I'm going to go back over to the place where we made our samples. Get some isopropanol on here. Give them a good wiping off of all the all the atoms. It's really important to use isopropanol and not water because these bits will rust. Cool. And this is our glass slide that we use. Let's clean that off as well. So now we put all these back in here and then we're uh, we're all finished. Okay. Thanks very much for watching this training video today. If you have any questions, you have to email us at xrd at sheffield.ac.uk and we'll be happy to answer them. So good luck using the machine. If you found that there's any errors in this video, please let us know.